The Periodic Table, Elements and Physical Chemistry exam on the OCRA specification for A-level chemistry has got multiple choice questions. The first 15 questions in the paper are multiple choice based on modules 2, 3 and 5. And the mark scheme, whilst of course it does contain the correct answers, provides no explanation of why those are the correct answers since it's just a series of letters. In this video, I'm going to take you through my answers to the June 2018 Periodic Table Elements and Physical Chemistry multiple choice questions so that you can understand and interpret the mark scheme more efficiently. Kicking off here then with question one. A sample of boron contains the isotopes of 10 and 11, and the relative atomic mass of the boron sample is 10.8. What's the percentage of boron 11 atoms in the sample of boron? Now, if you compare the two isotope mass numbers together, there's only one unit between them. So 10 to 11 is just that one unit. And the average, the relative atomic mass, the weighted average, is actually 10.8. So I'm going to consider that distance as a percentage to be 100%. And I can see that the 0.8 means that there's a weighting of 80% towards the 11. So I'm going to suggest the numbers of 20% and 80% for the 10 and the 11 respectively. If I then double check this and put them into my regular calculation for relative atomic mass using the isotope mass numbers and their percentage abundance, I do get an answer of 10.8. So the correct answer here is C. Moving on to question two. In the compound ICL2 plus SBCL6 minus, the oxidation number of the chlorine is negative one. What are the oxidation numbers of iodine and antimony in the compound? So I'm going to look at each ion one at a time. Now, the fact they are ions tells me, for example, for this first one, there's an imbalance of the oxidation states within the structure. So there's a weighting of positive compared to negative. And I've got to make sure that my oxidation states are going to add up to represent that. So each Cl in this formula, each chlorine is negative one with its oxidation state. So the total contribution from the chlorine, since there are two of them, is negative two. Each chlorine is still just minus one, but what I'm saying is total contribution by the chlorines here is negative two. Now, in order to make sure that there's a weighting here of positive overall, just a one plus, I've got to make sure that the iodine is positive three. Moving over to the other structure, I've got six of the CLs this time. So I've got six, lot, six lots of the negative one, so that's going to be give me a contribution from the chlorines of negative six overall. Now, the overall ionic charge this time is one minus. So I need to make sure that that weighting stays in the direction of the negative this time, meaning that the antimony can only be positive five, because that gives me that minus one overall. So in my table, I've not even looked at the table yet, you've noticed. In my table, I'm looking for plus three and plus five. So the correct answer here was C. Moving on to question three, what's the number of hydrogen atoms in 0.125 mol of ethanol? Well, in order to answer this question, what I need to do is figure out how many atoms of hydrogen there are per molecule. And you can see I've identified that right at the top here as six. And then using the mole value and the Avogadro number, I'm going to figure out the number of ethanol molecules. And then I'm going to multiply that value by six. And my correct answer here is B from the table. For question four, a student titrates a standard solution of barium hydroxide with nitric acid. You've got a volume and concentration for the barium hydroxide, and you've got a volume here for the nitric acid with the question of what is the concentration of the nitric acid. So with my little journey, we can see if I zoom in just here, we can see I've started over here on the left because I had concentration and volume information for the barium hydroxide. So I've worked out the number of moles, I've then ratioed across to find out the number of moles of nitric acid needed to neutralize this amount of moles of barium hydroxide. Now that ratio, you'll notice that it's my written version of this equation that's been used because you weren't given it. That ratio of one to two could only by, uh, be found by knowing that this was the correct reaction equation. So that is quite a big leap into the question here. That's quite a big step up. It's quite inaccessible if you're unable to get this equation drawn quickly. The number of moles here of the nitric acid then, that must be in the sample, is 2.25 times 10 to the power of negative 3. And so I find out the concentration of the nitric acid 
by doing moles over volume. I must make sure I use the correct volume here for the nitric acid, which is the 23.35, over 1,000, of course, to get it into decimeters cubed. And that gives me a value of 0.0964 moles per decimeter cubed as my concentration, which is option D. So here we are with question five. Question five tackles electron configuration, comparing nitrogen to oxygen. And the question is, which statement best explains why nitrogen has a larger first ionization energy than oxygen? So oxygen's amount of energy required to remove that outer electron is lower. And why is that? Well, when we consider their electron configurations, the nitrogen ends in 2p3, whereas the oxygen ends in 2p4. And that final electron there going into that p subshell or the outer shell of oxygen is paired in an orbital. So that final electron going into the oxygen electron configuration is paired in a p orbital. Whereas all of the electrons in the outer subshell of the nitrogen, which is going to be 2p3, they're all singly occupied in orbitals. And so with that oxygen one being paired in a p orbital, we experience extra repulsion, which makes it easier to remove. That means that nitrogen is going to have a larger first ionization energy because it doesn't have that extra repulsion taking place. Therefore, statement A is correct. The nitrogen atoms have less repulsion between the p orbital electrons than oxygen atoms. Moving on to question six. In the periodic table, element X is in group two and element Y is in group 15 or five, as most of us would call it. What is the likely formula of an ionic compound of X and Y? Well, being in group two means that if X is in an ionic structure, it's going to be two plus. Now, Y being in group five is very likely to be negative three, like a nitride ion or a phosphide ion. And so that's likely to be X two plus and Y three minus, meaning the formula when you put that together, so you're gonna need three lots of the X and two lots of the Y is gonna be option C, X three, Y two. Which statement about ammonium carbonate is not correct? Straight away here, you can see I've written out the ions because I'm going to need that all the way down. It reacts with barium nitrate to form a white precipitate. Yes, it does. Barium carbonate gets formed, so that one gets a tick. It effervesces with dilute nitric acid. Absolutely. Here's your reaction equation. We make some CO2. We get some effervescence there. It releases an alkaline gas with warm sodium hydroxide. It definitely does. The ammonium ion here reacts with the hydroxide ion to produce ammonia gas. That's in qualitative analysis as well. It has the formula NH4CO3. Absolutely not. The carbonate ion is CO3 2 minus and the ammonium ion is NH4 plus. So the formula is NH4 2 CO3. So the correct answer here for the incorrect statement is D. Moving on to question eight, a reaction is first ordered with respect to a reactant X. Which rate concentration graph for reactant X is the correct shape? So here's your summary of all the different shapes of these rate concentration graphs you're expected to know. And we can see here that the one you need to be aware of shows that directly proportional relationship between rate change and concentration change. It is A. Moving on to question nine. The reversible reaction of sulfur dioxide and oxygen to form sulfur trioxide is shown below. An equilibrium mixture contains all of these moles of the different components, and the total pressure is 250 atmospheres. What's the partial pressure of the SO3? All right. So in order to find partial pressure, I need mole fraction times the total pressure. But I don't have the mole fraction yet, so I need to find that first. I find the mole fraction by figuring out the total moles at equilibrium, which is four. All I've done is add these numbers up. And then I take the mole of the SO3, because this is the one I'm concerned about. And I've got 0.4 over 4 to give me a mole fraction of 0.1. I then do mole fraction times the total pressure, and that gives me the partial pressure for that component of the mixture. And so that is 25 atmospheres, giving me the correct answer of B. For question 10, quite a tricky buffer question, actually. It's quite sneaky to put that here. We're mixing together some propanoic acid and some sodium propanoate. Now the sodium propanoate has got a volume of 600 centimeters cubed and a current concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed. And the propanoic acid has got a volume of 200 centimeters cubed and a current concentration of two mole per decimeter cubed. Now, when you mix them together, the total volume is going to become 800 centimeters cubed. And those concentrations are going to be no longer valid to use in my rearrangement of the Ka expression, which is used for buffers. 
What I can do is convert them both into mole values and then recalculate their concentrations once they've been mixed together. But actually, with my rearrangement here, so that it's H plus equals Ka times the concentration of the acid in the buffer divided by the A minus ion concentration of the buffer, which would be the propanoate ion from the sodium propanoate in this example, I can actually use mole values because the acid and the A minus concentrations here are for the same volume, so the volume terms would cancel out. So if I can figure out the moles of the acid and the moles of the A minus from the data at the start of the question, I can just chuck those mole values in and it gives me the H plus ion concentration for the buffer. I minus log that value and I get the pH, which is the correct answer, C. Moving on to question 11. Don't forget that delta S is super. So when we are asked for the entropy change of this question, it's products minus reactants. And the correct answer here is negative 219.1, which is option A. I did notice here that option D is the same value, but with the opposite charge. And I think that is quite sly. I like that. Question 12. The redox equilibria for a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell in an alkaline solution are shown below. What's the equation for the overall cell reaction? Now, you might actually just know this. You know the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell is going to have the combustion of hydrogen as its overall equation like so. So you might have got to D very quickly here. But if you did actually combine the half equations together, then that's what I've done here. I've moved the top equation, so redox system 1 out of the 2. Because it had a more negative electrode potential, I've shifted it to the left and written it here in the oxidation direction. I've maintained the direction from left to right of the other one, redox system 2. I then combine them together here, cancel down the hydroxides, a bit of water and the electrons, giving me the overall equation, which actually is answer D. So you could have tackled this either way, but if you did actually know the uh, overall equation was going to be a combustion, you could have got to D very quickly for this one. Question 13, which enthalpy change is or are endothermic? So we've got the bond enthalpy of a CH bond. Bond enthalpies are always endothermic, so that one gets a tick. Second electron affinity of oxygen. Yep, second electron affinities are always going to be endothermic as well, so that gets a tick. This one made me pause for a moment. The standard enthalpy of formation of magnesium, well, it doesn't have one because it's an element. So that would be zero kilojoules per mole. And I think that's a little weird there, but I like what they did. So that means it's just one and two. So the correct answer there was B. Question 14, which statements um, explains, or I hate reading those, why reaction rates increase as temperature increases? Uh, well, statement one is completely incorrect. That's what a catalyst does. So I've got rid of that straight away. Statements two and three are the correct ones. So collisions between molecules are more frequent. They really like the term collisions in mark schemes and frequency to be mentioned. So I just wanted to highlight that there. And then statement three, a greater proportion of molecules have energy greater than the activation energy. They have actually brought up multiple choice questions before and asked for the main reason that the rate of reaction increases as temperature increases. And they did identify the third statement here as the main reason. So I've labeled that up. But both two and three are actual reasons. So the correct answer here was C, only two and three. Final question, question 15. Which statements or statements are... I hate reading these. Which statement, statements, is or are correct for the complex PT-NH32Cl2? So this is cisplatin, for example, that I've drawn here. Whenever I look at that, I instantly think of cisplatin, even though you could technically draw it in the transplatin um, layout. So one of the stereoisomers, so cisplatin is one of the stereoisomers, transplatin is the other stereoisomer, is used as an anti-cancer drug. Absolutely, of course, it is. So that's a correct statement. It has bond angles of 109.5 degrees. So at first, I just considered this bond angle here, and that's 90 degrees, so that's why I gave it the cross. But then actually, I had a little bit of a further think about this. One of the ligands here is ammonia. Now, it doesn't have bond angles of 109.5 degrees, but actually, I'm, I still want you to pause and consider that it does have bond angles, though, and these are 107 degrees um, within that ligand structure. It has optical isomers. It doesn't have optical isomers because the platinum isn't bonded to at least four different atoms or groups. So even as a, as a tweak on the one that you would normally look at in module six here or module five for optical isomerism, we definitely don't get that here. It's got uh, the square planar structure with two of one ligand and two of the other. So the correct answer here is only statement one, D.
I hope you found this tutorial helpful for explaining the answers to the multiple choice questions in the periodic table elements and physical chemistry paper from the 2018 OCRA A-level chemistry exam series. If you did find the video helpful, I would appreciate it if you could leave me a like before you go so that YouTube knows I still exist. And until next time, everybody, happy revising.